Thank you to CuriosityStream for sponsoring this episode. Hello, welcome to Up and Adam. I'm Jade. There's nothing else quite like time. Always flowing toward the future, but never the past. Why is time a one-way street? We can go backwards and forwards in space, so why not time? Well, what if I told you that the direction of time could one day change? That time flows both forwards and backwards. To understand the nature of time, we need to start with the nature of space. We can learn a lot about space just by throwing a ball in the air. Now move five meters to the left and lo and behold, the exact same thing happens. We've just demonstrated a deep truth about our universe. The laws of physics do not change depending on where you are in space. This is called space translation symmetry. Similarly, if you throw a ball at 8 a.m. and then again at 8 p.m., the result is the same. This is called time translation symmetry. It tells us that the laws of physics do not change with time. Symmetries are the most fundamental ideas in physics. They tell us about the structure of our universe. Space translation symmetry tells us that space is the same everywhere. This means that the laws of physics cannot distinguish between whether we are in one place or another. The behavior of the ball doesn't tell us anything about where we are. The same is true for time translation symmetry. We can't tell which of these clips was taken earlier or later just from observing the behavior of the ball. A surprising symmetry of our universe is time reversal symmetry, sometimes called T-symmetry. Amazingly, there is no physical difference between backwards and forwards in time. Unlike the other symmetries, we can't physically demonstrate this because we can't reverse time, but we can simulate it by reversing the direction of velocity. This is achieved by playing a video backwards. One of these clips is played forwards and the other backwards. Just like we can't tell where we are in space, we also can't tell whether we're going backwards or forwards in time. According to Newton, a direction of time is not baked into the fabric of our universe, but this isn't what we experience at all. In fact, it's usually extremely obvious when a video is being played forwards or backwards. Newton's laws are the foundation on which much of physics relies. From them, we've built rockets to explore the cosmos or predicted the movement of the planets. So why do they say something so contrary to our experience? And if the direction of time doesn't come from Newton's laws, where does it come from? To answer these questions, we need to go back to the 1800s. A new branch of science was forming, thermodynamics. This was the science of heat, pressure, temperature, and volume. It was a science based on observation and experiment, rather than theories or explanations. One of the pioneers of thermodynamics, Rudolf Clausius, noticed that systems always tend to equilibrium. If you bring a hot and cold object together, left to their own devices, their temperatures would eventually average out. Once a system reaches equilibrium, it stays there forever, never spontaneously going back the way it came. But no one knew why. Clausius called this tendency for a system to move toward equilibrium an increase in entropy. You might have heard entropy described as a measure of disorder, but a more accurate definition is the measure of how close a system is to equilibrium. The closer it is to equilibrium, the higher its entropy. The further away it is, the lower its entropy. And just to be crystal clear, equilibrium is the state in which the system is perfectly balanced and no longer changes. This most often looks like the most disordered state. Clausius declared it a physical law that the entropy of a closed system always increases or stays the same. It never decreases. We now call this the second law of thermodynamics. At the time, it was huge. For the first time in history, we had a law of physics that distinguishes between the forwards and backwards directions of time. If entropy is increasing, we're going forwards. If entropy is decreasing, we're going backwards. But this breakthrough came at a cost. 
we now have a conflict between two major fields of physics, the time symmetric laws of Newtonian mechanics and the time asymmetric laws of thermodynamics. Was there a different set of rules for different fields of physics? Was a direction of time baked into our universe or not? Like us, a Viennese physicist named Ludwig Boltzmann saw this conflict as unacceptable. He didn't believe for a second there could be one set of laws for one major field of physics and a different set for another, and made it his life's work to unify them. Boltzmann had just finished his PhD on something called the kinetic theory of gases. The idea that gas consisted of millions of tiny particles, all bouncing around with some kinetic energy. This provided a link between mechanics and thermodynamics. Each particle could be viewed as a tiny ball that obeys Newtonian mechanics, while the gas as a whole followed thermodynamics. The challenge was how to derive a time asymmetric gas from time symmetric particles. The answer? Collisions. As the particles bounce around, they inevitably bump into each other and the walls. A particle will continue moving in a straight line until it collides with another one or the wall. They move much further in the direction of free space simply because they're less likely to collide with something. However, it isn't guaranteed, just overwhelmingly likely. There are still arrangements where the particles stay bunched up forever. They're just extremely unlikely. So unlikely that for a regular gas, we'd have to wait much longer than the age of the universe to see this. Almost any arrangement guarantees they spread out, while only very few specific arrangements have them remaining bunched up. Boltzmann had shown that the journey from order to disorder was in fact a journey from the improbable to the probable. The second law was not a strict physical law, but rather a statistical law. A single particle obeyed Newton's mechanical laws, while a group of particles acted as a probabilistic process. This phenomenon is beautifully captured in this simple and elegant equation. This was brilliant, but Clausius wasn't very happy about the demotion of his robust physical law to a mere statistical one. It had changed from the entropy of a closed system must always increase or stay the same to the entropy of a closed system will probably increase or stay the same. Doesn't sound as good, does it? But whether it sounded good or not, Boltzmann's theory answered a lot of questions. It reconciled the time symmetry of Newtonian mechanics with the time asymmetry of thermodynamics. It also seemed to answer why we experience a direction of time in our everyday lives. We live life at the macro scale. We experience a crude surface level world. We don't see the millions of microscopic particles that make it up. If we only had access to the micro world, we wouldn't experience a direction of time. It's an emergent property. Isn't that crazy? Entropy is a macro phenomenon. The fact that it's overwhelmingly likely to increase is what gives our universe its forward arrow of time. All was well in the land of physics. Until Joseph Loschmidt was Boltzmann's colleague and friend and couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As a side remark in one of his papers, he scribbled an argument along the lines of, you say it is more probable for a system to evolve from a state of low probability to a state of high probability. However, for every state that evolves toward higher entropy, there is an opposite state that evolves toward lower entropy. All one needs to do is flip the direction of the velocities of all the molecules and they will all go back the way they came. Of course, this is perfectly allowed because of the time symmetric nature of Newtonian mechanics. This means that there are equally many states evolving toward lower entropy as there are evolving toward higher entropy. So how can you conclude that it's more probable for a system to evolve one way over the other? This flipped Boltzmann's theory on its head. Let's investigate. When you flip a coin, there's an equal chance it'll come up heads or tails. This was the nature of Loschmidt's objection. Because of the reversibility of Newtonian mechanics, for every state moving toward higher entropy, there existed a flip state moving toward lower entropy there are an equal number of each. So if we choose a state at random, there's a 50-50 chance that it evolves toward higher entropy or lower entropy. 
What Boltzmann was claiming was that it was much more probable to get heads over tails, even though they both have equal probability of coming up. This is called the time reversibility paradox. Loschmidt had somehow logicked his way to the result that the universe should decrease in entropy just as often as it increases. In other words, time should go backwards just as often as it goes forwards. But again, this isn't what we experience at all. Now this isn't just about reconciling the laws of mechanics and thermodynamics, but logic and reality. How would Boltzmann get us out of this one? Here he makes his most daring insight yet. What if Loschmidt is right? What if the direction of time does go backwards just as often as it goes forwards? All of the systems we've talked about so far follow a similar entropy evolution. For example, the universe started in a very low entropy state near the Big Bang. It's been increasing ever since, and one day, if things keep going the way they've been going, we'll reach equilibrium. It'll fluctuate around there because that's the most probable state. But every once in a while, we'll see a big decrease in entropy. Remember, this isn't impossible, just highly improbable. There's still a tiny chance it'll happen if we wait long enough. Just like there's a tiny chance we'll flip 10,000 heads in a row if we flip coins long enough. These decreases are immediately followed by increases back to comfortable equilibrium. But here's a question. Why do we always start in such a low entropy state? Equilibrium is the most likely state. This is an extremely improbable state. In fact, if we do begin at equilibrium, Loschmidt's argument checks out. Decreases in entropy happen just as often as increases. There is no universal direction of time, but only pockets of backwards and forwards. To drive the point home, imagine this curve is a hiking trail with valleys scattered throughout. If you saw someone here, you can infer two things. At some point in the past, they were most likely at higher altitude, and at some point in the future, they will most likely be at higher altitude. What you can't infer is the direction they were going. This path does not have an inbuilt direction. You can flip it either way and it still makes sense. The same goes for entropy. It's true that if we're at a low entropy point, in the future, we'll most likely be at higher entropy. But it's also true that in the past, we were most likely at higher entropy. Entropy is higher in both directions. This curve does not have an arrow of time. The second law of thermodynamics, that entropy is overwhelmingly likely to increase, only holds if we assume that we started in a low entropy state. But there's no logical basis to this assumption. It's just what happened. Why did our universe start in such an improbable state? This is now one of the biggest unsolved questions in cosmology. I'd love to share some possible answers with you, but we're out of time. Thanks to Boltzmann and Loschmidt, we now know that the direction of time is not built into our universe, but is a result of the way it started. Today we covered a lot in a very little amount of time. I'm sure you have some questions like, if entropy is always increasing, why do we see so much spontaneous order around us? How does entropy ever decrease? Does that mean time is going backwards inside my refrigerator? What's the link between entropy and information? There's a wonderful documentary series on CuriosityStream which answers all of these questions and more. It's called Order and Disorder. Presented by famous physicist Jim Al-Khalili, it gives a complete overview of the key concepts we talked about today, discussing the historical landmarks that led to innovation and diving deeper into the ideas. I was fascinated to learn what drove the scientists in the 1800s and came away feeling inspired and in awe. Curiosity Stream makes award-winning documentaries, ranging from deep space to dinosaurs to ancient Egypt. They've also partnered with a bunch of us educational YouTube creators with our own streaming platform, Nebula. Nebula is a place where we can make content without the pressure of the YouTube algorithm. We can be more experimental and try new things. I've made a couple of Nebula originals, which you can check out. We're both passionate about learning, so we've put together a bundle where you can get both streaming services for the price of one. They currently have a 26% discount on at the moment too. 
Just sign up to Curiosity Stream with the link curiositystream.com slash upandatom or click the link in the description. From there, you'll get free access to Nebula 2. Thank you so much for watching and supporting the channel. That's it from me and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.